Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy you've joined us today to interview on Cinema Television Network. I am so excited to interview certain members of the, of the cast of The Text Collector. It's the number one uh, live streamed movie in, the, in uh, I think it's on Amazon or Apple TV on all of the above. And with me tonight is one who's an incredible dear dear person who I love so much and I'm so excited to have her again with us and it's Lana Peria who is playing this incredible um, character which is so real. You really have to see her because it's a very difficult character in this movie and she really brings a certain reality to it that blew me away. And then, of course, we have Cheyenne Ray Hernandez, who's playing Gata, the bad girl. Yeah. And she does an incredible job, too. So welcome. And I can't wait to enter into this conversation and let it reveal itself. You heard of me? What have you heard? I heard you the devil. I might be. Ah, come on, boy. Good, eh? Every gang in LA has to pay their taxes. What's up, Holmes? Where'd you go? If you stack short, go rob a bank. Rob your own mother. There's no excuses. Do not test that. Oh, hey, whoa, whoa. Guys look like a couple of monsters. Who the hell, man? Yeah, but I'm at peace with that. What's up, Johnny Cash? How about that time you gave me like three different STDs? Are you kidding? I'm just kidding. She's kidding. You got your wife, you got your kids, you got your castle. Daddy! I'm supposed to terrorize the herd. That's my function. God allows me to walk through the darkness and come back into the light. What did you see in me? I heard that you were this big bad gangster. You're taxing 43 different street gangs. That's thousands of dudes in the most violent subculture in Los Angeles. The count's short. Who are you? I'm the future, and you the past. You got your kids. You want to buy them back? You don't think he wants to spill blood? He wants to cut your heart up. Can't run for what's left. I got a 380 on each ankle, 38 on my right, 25 on my left, chopper in the trunk, Glock on my belt. I'm on it. Took my kids, man. I'm riding with you till the wheels fall off. You're bad. You ain't that bad, all right? Open your mouth. Okay. He'll splatter your brains out. I don't want that. I do. I want that. I can't tell you how happy we are to have you on the show interviews because this entire effort of this movie touches a nerve in our entire country, but also in Los Angeles particularly, because we have a world within a world that very few people really understand. And I think uh, this movie is so real in terms of how it interpreted that whole culture. So I'm thrilled to be able to actually talk to both of you about the movie and about this, re this phenomena that is, on is occurring in the subculture of our own city. So um, first of all, Cheyenne, welcome to the industry and welcome <laughs> to the film industry. And we are so happy to welcome you. I know this is your first movie and it's the most amazing entry into our industry because you truly wear the character brilliantly. And Thank I you. was actually stunned and surprised how honestly you took on this character and how you were wearing this character so well. Now, you know, knowing that you actually were in the army and, you know, and you really dealt with the whole issue of survival from a whole other aspect. 
tell me how much of that did you carry into the film and where did you find that whole historical level in your life come into play? Well, I definitely carried a lot of um, my soldier self into being Gata. And I feel like throughout my life when I've had to go through these periods of just raw survival, I mean, I was homeless in LA at, too at one point. So it, when I went through that, I still had these these inhibitions within me, which was, you know, still be kind, still be honest, be truthful, you know, be giving. And so it's like you, you have your, your moral compass that's inside of you that you're, you're, you're circling around as you're surviving. So in order to be Gata, I had to get rid of those inhibitions. So Gata is just pure, raw, animalistic survival. So she is what happens when humanity allows the worst of itself to surface. She is when you stop caring about who thinks what, who says what, you don't care who lives or dies, you only care about surviving. And so it was hard. And even on set, there was a couple of times where my humanity did come out. And one in particular was in that scene where I'm hammering Shia. I know at one point Gonejo had this cigar and he moved it away from his mouth and some of the ashes fell on Shia. And so in this, I'm very in this scene and I'm supposed to be hurting him. And all of a sudden the humanity part of my brain just kind of ticked. And I was a combat medic in the army, so I ran to the medic and I was like, aloe, aloe, aloe. And then they gave me aloe and I come back and I'm rubbing aloe vera on Shia's chest as I'm <laughs> supposed to be killing him, you know? So it, it was a, a constant struggle and battle in my mind um, for who I am and who she is and letting go of who I was to become her. But the soldier part came in when it was dealing with weapons, when it was thinking about this dog eat dog world, because when I was in the military, it was really hard. It was survival. I was one of the only females in an infantry unit. So it, it wasn't a struggle every day to be myself. And so I wound up choosing not to be. Um, now, that's amazing. So when you're talking about Gada, you know, she obviously had a whole life before the entering this moment of her life, where yes. all of a sudden it was about pure survival. And she had to survive no matter what. And the only way she knew how is to by eliminating any kind of conflict that could be dangerous. But who mm -hmm. was that before in terms of your perception of the character? Well, I actually have journals of her past life. Uh, when I that was the amazing thing about working with David Ayer is he gives you this character, but he allows you to write their past so that can it can be authentic. It can be real for you when you're on camera. So I have journals of where she was, uh, she was sold. She was sold and she was used. And so she took what she thought was her weakness, which is, you know, people wanted her because she was cute. She was pretty. And so when she was sold, she was used a lot. And so in order to kind of take back her power, she decided I'm gonna use my sexuality as a weapon now. And so everybody else around her became her toy. She was no longer anybody else's toy. And that's why she has this, I don't care about life or death. She has this cold detachment from that, that disables her ability to feel anything when she's killing somebody. And that's really interesting, and Lana, you can jump in, but I know, uh, for instance, I've been working with the Congress and the Senate and the government for years and years and years against sex trafficking. Now, it just so happens that sex trafficking is a $91 billion business. And right now in California, we have 600 girls who are in prison for life without parole, most of them colored, they were actually put in jail as teenagers and preteens. They were sold, raped, tortured, and whatever by their pimps. And not one pimp went to jail, but all these girls. And it's because they killed their pimps. 
that they are in prison for life without parole. And so I was thinking about that when I was watching you. Now what I find when I visit them in prison is that they've put such a shield, they feel nothing. You know, and I felt that from you and I was wondering where the hell did you get that? I mean, it's not like I've seen you over there, you know? So. Yeah. Uh, I, the thing is, is w when I saw Gatha's role, she didn't have too many lines or anything, but she was this cold, calculated killer. And I had to understand how does somebody get that demented? What happened to her to make that justifiable in her head? So. I gave her that backstory of she was used and she killed her own father because her father was the one who sold her because she wasn't doing what he wanted as far as um, joining the gang and he killed her mother. So there was this whole backstory on what exactly twisted her from the inside out to make her that way. And I lived it. I, I told myself every single day that that was my life. And so I, I began to see people differently. And a lot of friends around me, Lana included, saw these changes and they were worried about me. I remember several times <laughs> Lana reaching out saying, I'm worried about you, I'm thinking about you, are you okay? And I just had this shadow over me that I could not get rid of. Yeah. And even after the movie wrapped, I just, I dove so deep into this crazy world that got the was a part of where it was almost like, I didn't want to speak to my own father. I didn't want to, you know, it was just, it was so real for me that it was just, it was crazy. Yeah. But I um, noticed like with, with Cheyenne, especially because this is her first movie and she's, you know, sort of young in this industry and in acting and she's like, you know, starting out and she's really diving into this character, which is so great. And when the movie was over, it was like she got stuck in Gotha for a while. And I understand that because I, I come from a semi-method background and, you know, I still battle with like elements of Evil Queen Regina who <laughs> played her for seven years, right? So I have to still like, wait, that's not me, that's her. <laughs> but um, but it, I was concerned. I was very concerned for Cheyenne because I saw her sort of stepping in, she stepped so far deep into Gatha that she, you can still see Cheyenne. I mean, if you see her, you know, she's like this bubbly, loving, you know, medic, you know, caretaker. She's a, a great friend, a good sister. I can say it's funny because I'm from the other side of the family, but we found each other. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. But, but um, you know, and talk about that, you know, some more in a, in a second, Lana, because what I found interesting about your character that really blew me away and what I said to you, oh my God, what a departure, you know, because this is a world that behind closed doors, it's a family that has religion. They sit around the, the breakfast table and they hold hands and they say prayers. They are waking up in the bedroom and the little daughter runs up and she has a loose tooth, you know? I mean, all these lovely things about a family. And then you are there and it was so interesting to me because the reality of the machismo was something that was emerging even behind closed doors. And I could see in your character, you know, reacting but not reacting and accepting, you know? And so my question to you is, you knew that behind those closed doors, there's a jungle. And that that jungle is actually the survival that pays the bills and gives you the home and gives you all the opportunities. And you kept being kind of like this, the center of the nervous system that kept everything in the family real in a different way. So it was about the family. So where was your, what was your point of view in terms of the character, knowing that behind that closed door is the jungle that you're really facing every second of every day? Yeah, well, it, you know, the challenging part of that was her 
talk about a moral compass was Favi's moral compass, which is she's kind of married into this, you know, she right. is um, the sister of David's wife. So it's like, she's single, she has a kid, she um, has a very hard time finding love for herself. Um, she is very family oriented. And this is her little sister. And she is very concerned about, you know, where can this lead? And yet she benefits from it. So it's like, there's, there's only so much that she can say without also getting herself in trouble. It's a scary world. You can't, you know, I grew up more around the Italian mafia, which is like what I can relate it to. Right, I related to that too. I was thinking about that, like the 20s yeah. and the 30s and the 40s and the mafia and Al Capone and all that stuff. Yeah, and you grow up around that and, and where I'm from, you know, they were our neighbors and it's just, you know what not to say. You know, when you see something, you don't repeat it. You know, so there, so that for me was kind of like what I brought to the character because I knew that, you know, there were some moments where um, it was a little bit, you know, not everything made it into the film, but there was a, a scene um, that didn't make it into the film where you got a little taste of how Favi felt about her brother-in-law, David. And there was a, a, a very evident dislike for him and what he does. There was a judgment. And yet, you know, she could, she still, she still loves him but she resents him and she's really fearful for her sister more than anything and the family as a whole and trying to keep everyone together. But she also, you know, she, she also is envious of it too. She's also envious of the life that her younger sister has. She, she wants it yet. She doesn't want it like that. She wants love. She wants the big house. She wants the money, but she doesn't want it in that world. You know, so she, that was, there was a, a part of that, that, um, that was there in the character. I don't think we saw it in the scene cause it wasn't really, um, it didn't make it into the film, but there, there was a bit of that, uh, beginning of the dinner scene where there, that conversation was taking place and you can see it with looks and the exchange between David and Fabi and her sister and Fabi. And you can see that there was like this envy yet protection. She was constantly conflicted with, um, you know, her feelings about her sister, the situation and her own needs. So it was, it, it was a very complex layered character that I had a great time playing. Um, and then later you see when David actually pays for the Kingston yet just for her daughter, you see that she's really kind and she's trying and she's thankful and, and grateful and she's trying to sort of, you know, I guess, accept him on some level. Um, that was my backstory. There was a lot of stuff that we have, like Cheyenne was talking about, like David said, you know, here, here, do what you want with this character. And then he would have conversations with us about it. But um, I, I'm not sure if all of that was prevalent in the performance. I think yes, so. it was because there okay, were moments where I saw your conflict in your eyes because you were kind of like looking at him and looking at her. Yeah. And looking at the little girl. Yeah. It was so weird just the way you looked at them. And I think it really did come from within because something made you think about what is this? What is this? You know? And yeah, it was so sure. prevalent, even though it was so subtle, I loved it. Thank because you. Because that what I, was, I, I would love to see more from actors is this, the language, the language from the eyes that tell you more than dialogue ever does, you know? Yeah. And well, she said so much in one word. And when I saw the I movie, know, and, I know. And you said the part where, okay, so when Bobby's, uh, well, David is giving Fabi a whole bunch of crap at the table, and then Fabi says, Alexis, it's just with that one word that just says, like, that Fabi has complained to Alexis a million times about all of this, and she's kind of telling Alexis, like, if you don't shut him up, I will. I will say everything that is not being said right now. And so when you said that, I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. But let's talk about 
the the reality of what this movie says because i think that's what this interview should encourage people to see because this is happening right now in this town in east l.a all the time i i told you i did um a documentary about East LA called How We Fell Out From the Grace of God. And I spent a lot of time with 18th Street Gang and the leader of 18th Street Gang. And one of the things that he said to me was blew me away because he said to me, well, it wasn't any different when it was my father. He just wore different clothes, you know? And he walked me down on the bridge where his father was when it was all the zoot suits and all those wars, you know? And I realized, and I talked to Eddie Alamos about it, and because he had done so much in that, about that whole thing. And he said, yes, it is so, you know, the whole thing is generational, but it's happening out there and it's happening in a different way than any of us understand because it's never on the news and people get killed, and it's a whole world on its own. So my question to you, Lana, particularly, because I know, I, I know you, and I know when you do anything, you take the entire encompass, and you bring it in, and you, you look at it all, and you narrow it down into the culture you are emerging into, you know? And so, I want to know how much time did you spend really understanding this whole culture and what it, what it meant to you and how you related in your own life to it. And I know also that when Black Lives Matter happened with George Floyd, you were the first one to go on Instagram and make big noise about it. You know, the first Instagram I received was you. Oh, so wow. I know how conscientious you are. So talk to me about what this movie really means and what you think it should do in terms of the, the, the audience and, and, and our whole community. Well, um, you know, this movie is very complex. And the thing with David Ayer is he has this, this gift of, uh, and, and also background of being on the inside. You know, right. this is this is a world that he is very familiar with. He is he is a combination of Bobby Soto's character David right. and Shaya, and right. he really is. And you know, there was that whole com I think there was some sort of talk about Shaya being you know brown going, being brown face or something. And I and I couldn't disagree. I mean, there there are a lot of these. Um, uh, white white people that grew up in the hood. I knew it, but I come from Brooklyn. So we always had like white boy Mikey, you know, and we always knew guys like this that were grew up in these Latin cultures and in and, and these communities that were really, really influenced by it. And so that's how I saw Shia's character. And I knew those guys. Um, and I also knew the guys in the hood, <laughs> you know, the guys that were selling drugs, the guys that were killing people, the guys that, and they were my neighbors you know, except it took place in Brooklyn. So for my, for me, seeing this world, just being in Los Angeles, how I understood it was how I understood the world in New York City, which it was, it was more gang related. I feel like LA is a little more segregated than it is in New York. In New York, you have like your gangs, you know, but in LA you have that too, but sometimes it's like you have more of your communities where I feel like in New York, a lot of people are kind of mixed up. You know, everyone's right. Coming. You have territories here, like 18th yeah. Street Gang has their own territory. Right. And some of the other gang, Hazard Street Gang, is around Hazard Street. So it's divided by territories. Yeah, and in New York, it's similar as well. And I knew a lot of these kids that were selling drugs, and I knew kids that were killed because of it. I mean, these you know kids I grew up with. Um, so for me, when I read this film, it was like, wow, I finally get to to be in something that I, that no one's ever seen me do, but it's a world right. that I understand so deeply because I grew up in it. And yet no one's ever seen this in me. I'm especially coming off of once upon a time playing a Royal queen that couldn't be further than who I am, <laughs> you know, as a person. 
So, um, you know, so it, for me, it was like, oh, I get this. And I feel that, um, you know, part of LA, there's a lot of parts of LA that people don't see. And we filmed in South Central. We were in these parts that were dangerous. And, um, and, uh, and yet we were protected because we were doing a movie and we were telling their stories. And there's a level of respect that comes with that. Right. And it's a very complex world. Um, I can't judge it because who am I to judge? But um, I think it's an important film because we have to, it, it's educational. And, and no That's directors exactly are- right. It's educational. And I read the reviews and stuff and I don't think they understood. I spent an entire year there. So I understood it. And that's why yeah. I'm so eager to talk to you guys about it because it's very real. And David the Ayer is the, one of the only film directors that are actually telling these stories. Right, right. And, he, and he's done it, you know, if you just look at his previous films like End of Watch and also Training Day, like these are all his films that are, you know, about a world that he grew up in that he is very passionate about. He loves the Mexican culture. He loves the Latino community. He's a white man, but he feels like he's Mexican. <laughs> you know, what I mean? he really speaks Spanish. He loves Mexican food. You're like, this man is a, is a Mexican man trapped in a white boy's body, and um, and, and he really is the only film director I know that are telling these stories. And it's important, important stories, because sometimes when you're not Latino you actually have an outsider's point of view that's more accurate because right. you see all the innuendos and all the colors and you touch all the spots, the hot spots. But Cheyenne, so we you know when this obviously is your first film, but you've, got, you've had quite a journey getting here. So I think you have a lot to give to the screen and to movies because of your own journey. I know not just about the army, but I know that you had some real tragedies, but you took the risk to come to Los Angeles because you felt that this industry as an artist is your life for yeah. the of your life. So tell me about that journey, because I know that you went through such trauma that it changed your life. Yeah, I... I honestly feel, and I, I just told David this the other day, that um, I, I owe my life to him. I really do. Because I feel like I was on a very bad path before. Um, my brothers, uh, if you read, were uh, killed by a drunk driver. And so when that happened, I was very suicidal. I was still in the military, and they put me on very heavy medication just to kind of make me less crazy. And it made me feel more crazy. It just, it, I became a zombie. I didn't feel anything anymore. I was alive, but not living. Uh, I tried to commit suicide a couple of times. And I just, I didn't want to be on this planet anymore. It's, it was just as simple as that. I felt like before it was when I thought of having kids and getting married and having a life, it was my brothers, their kids were gonna be there too. You know, it was, it was going to be our family parties. It was going to be, we're going to have the quinceañeras together where everything was with them. We're going to, and I had this picture of what my life was going to be. And my little brother and I, we were going to be on the big screen together. And he was going to join the military and he was going to get stationed with me. So when that life just no longer existed, I didn't have a plan B. And so I fell into pretty dark place. And then when I realized that I wasn't keeping my promise to my brother, I had promised him when he passed that I would do this for both of us, that I would live out all of our dreams. So I still have to get a pilot's license as well for my big brother, Joshua, because he died, really wanted to do that. And so I realized I'm not keeping my promises. Uh, if they're watching me, they are angry because they were watching me just wither away. And so when I moved to LA, it was one of those things where it was like, either I'm going to die or I'm going to go do this. And I went and it just 
started happening. And yeah, I was homeless for a while. It was hard. Um, but I had this feeling of, and the best way I can describe this is I felt when, when I was on the right path and I did something closer to getting me here, I felt like there was air in my veins and I felt like I was just going to fly up at any moment. And that's how I knew, stay on this path. You're doing something right. You're doing something right. And then it was like, I would meet people and I would see something in them that I, I can't explain. And then it, one of them was my acting coach and she just saw something in me. And she's like, I just, I see something in you. I think that, I think that we can do something. And then she introduced me to my manager and he said the same thing. And then David Ayer said the same thing. And then Lana said the same thing. And it was like, I have these soul connections with people that let me know I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And Lana pulled me out even more of that dark place that I was in because even through tax collector, I was in a really dark place after tax collector, really dark place. And I felt like, like Lana and um, our best friend Trish, they just loved me through it. And I felt like I, I was existing, existing, existing. And then now I'm where I'm supposed to be because of love. Like I, I was a soldier, so I, I had combat boot calluses. I didn't know how to walk in heels. Lana taught me how to walk in heels on set. And <laughs> we would, <laughs> I would stay the night at Lana's house and you know, some women, they, they can be petty, you know, they, if they're going to teach you something, they're going to make sure that you feel less than them in, when, as they're teaching you. Lana, we would wake up and she would, she would just be very, <laughs> very sweet and go see me doing my makeup and then say, well, this is how I do my makeup. And then she would do her makeup. And I didn't feel like she was like, no, you're doing it wrong. I felt like I... I never had a big sister and I felt like Lana was just being my big sister. She was teaching me how to put on makeup. She was teaching me how, I mean, she's still teaching me etiquette. Doesn't always pan out, right? But <laughs> you're doing great. Beautiful. It's so beautiful. I mean, I, you know, the first I time that I met Lana, I felt like I was meeting somebody with his heart as big as an entire nation. You know, and, and it's so beautiful, Lana, that you really reached out and it's what it's all about. You know, if we can all just reach out to each other and help each other through difficult moments, we all win because what else is there? You know, so how's your life now? I mean, have you been able to find a place and people and is your yeah, life? It's I mean, I, I still have Lana and Trish. They are, I mean, when I get married one day, they're going to be in the wedding. That's how much I love them. Um, but, um, I think that through Tax Collector, I learned how to love. Um, I learned how to love myself. I learned how to love other people and let other people love me. That took a bit. Like I know on, on set, um, Bobby Soto, he would come up and hug me and I would kind of just tense up and he'd go, love me back. And so I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and so I had to learn how to be comfortable again in my own skin on set. And then after that, it was like, I don't know, I was just more open to life. I, I feel like I was just guilty. I was guilty that I was alive and my brothers weren't. You know, I was, I was guilty that I, well, every time I smiled, every time I laughed, I just felt this overwhelming guilt. And, and now I feel like I've learned to live my life and enjoy my life and to look up and be like, did you see that? Did you see that? You know, and so, so I still talk to them all the time, but I, I, I feel like because of this, I've met my partner, uh, Simon, who I absolutely adore. I've been with him for almost two years now. And I feel like because of Lana, because of David, because of the whole cast of the movie, I was able to love myself and respect myself and respect somebody else. And it's just, it's opened so many more doors. And I feel like wh who I was before was this, I would put up a wall, I would put up, put on a mask and people could tell, people could tell that I wasn't authentic. They could tell that I, I wasn't really myself. And I feel like I've gotten so much further by some of the stuff I say may be shocking and everybody in the room will be like, what did she just say? But 
it is me. <laughs> you know, so. No, it's beautiful. And so what's happening now? Where, what are you doing next? Well, COVID's affected so much. Oh my my God. Life. Tell me about it. Oh my God. Oh my God. But I am so much better when I can be in front of people. So the fact that all of my meetings are on Zoom and stuff, it's really hard. Um, but I'm doing what I can. I, I'm looking at a couple of projects, nothing set in stone, but I'm just seeing where it goes. Well, if there's anything we can do to help, we are very happy to help you. Have my number, or Lana will give you my number. Oh, yeah. I'm really happy oh. to help in any way I can. Because oh, thank you. It's really wonderful that you've gone through this. I mean, trauma, you, you have to, unfortunately, we all have to go through it to get to the other side. And yeah. it takes people like Lana to help you do that. So it's just, incredible again my beautiful lana you're just such an angel it's amazing um so lana what's next so uh a few things i've been working on um i'm i'm developing one show right now and um and we're seeing where that lands it's really interesting of course i can't talk about it because it's developing um, I've been developing it for a while and it's, it's starting to kind of find a different shape um, than where it started, which is good. Well, it started here and then it kind of took a, like a turn and then and now it's kind of going back to where it was. So I'm working on that. Um, I recorded a song, which is kind of interesting. Oh my God, do you have it? I want to hear. So I, and I just, the, so the DJ, he's, his name is Glow Vibes and he's Italian. And he, um, he asked me if I wanted to do, lay down some tracks for him, some, some, some song. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, sure. Let me, let me read the lyrics. And I read the lyrics and I read it and I was like, yeah, let's play. So now he's, it's like dance house music from the nineties and Oh my that's like, you know, so New York style, right? So it's, he has like a very like old school vibe to it. Um, and he just sent me the cut yesterday and he's like, do not let anyone hear this just yet. So I can't let anyone hear just yet, but um, I finally just got it yesterday and, and it's really sounding great and I'm, I'm really liking it. Um, well, you but know, it, when you sang in before, I was like, yeah. so I, we talked about that. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I love it. I just so love it. glad you're doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and, that's wonderful. Um, it's, a, it's so, you know, it's been this, like, it's one of those things where you just don't let opportunities pass you by. Exactly. You know, something came to me, and I had a choice, and I thought, well, why not just go for it, you know? So I did. And during COVID, it's, it's an opportunity to try new things. I started um, a t-shirt sort of streetwear line called Keep It Regal. And I, um, I love it. People are really responding well to it. You can find it at keepitregal.net or keepitregal.com now will take you to the other website. So um, it, that's doing well and I'm having fun designing uh, shirts and, and sweatsuits and things like that. So, and what hoodies. I love it. I love it. So I'm, I'm trying to branch outside of my acting career and try other things and seeing if, you know, whatever lands and just being creative is, is the most important thing for me. So I think the industry is beginning to figure out how to do productions in this period. Cause I don't think they, virus is about to leave us you know i think we're still having to go through some changes but the key is just to be loving and caring and reach out to each other and try to promote each other and you know and we're here for you and you know that so um this is all gonna be good it's all gonna be good but this movie definitely should get people to watch it because it definitely unveils the realities that we need to unveil in our community and it's not only here it's in new york as well and everywhere in texas and 
all of that. So I think it's really important. I think you guys did a brilliant job. I mean, the acting in this movie and Shia, oh my God, you know, he creeped me out. But anyway, and David, I mean, he was brilliant. So, uh, I mean, Bobby, I call him David because that's his character's name. But, um, you know, I think you guys did a brilliant job on this. And I think it deserves genuine attention. And also it deserves the Academy to really focus because the characters were beyond real. And I just have to congratulate you, really. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so much for coming on interview and on Cinema and I love you. And Diane, you. you're gonna have a wonderful future. You are. Thank you so much. Blessings. And thank Lana, I love you to death. I love you. <laughs> thank you. So good to see you. Thank you.